Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, the first book of Timothy. Timothy, uh, the first time Paul met him, he was a teenager, a young teenager. Seven years later, he comes by and, and uh, Timothy is a young adult. He taught well by his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois. Nothing is mentioned ever of Timothy's father. But they were Hellenist, meaning they were Hebrews that spoke in the Greek tongue, that studied in the Greek tongue. That's what a Hellenist is. And, but Paul was very proud of this one. He adopted him spiritually as his son, and he intends to use him to instruct and to, to discipline the church. And that's what Timothy is about. It's a pastoral letter telling Christians how to act and how to react. And, and what a book it is. Let's get right into it. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1 reads, I exhort therefore, Paul to Timothy, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, don't, don't forget other people, pray for them, intercede for them, and giving of thanks, don't forget to thank our Father. So many people leave that out of their lives. They're blessed with truth and knowledge and wisdom, but they forget to just say, Father, thank you. I needed that. It's so very important. Be made for all men. That is to say, be thankful for all men that believe, that see, and Again, as I stated in the last lecture, God's elect have a special cho uh, duty. That is to say, to see that the principle that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, Paul would say in the 15th verse of that first chapter. That's what the purpose is, is bringing salvation to whomsoever will. But they've got to believe, else you do not cast your pearls before swine, and you do plant seeds and then move on. If there are no ears there to hear, you're not to worry about it. Verse 2, for kings, notice the lower case, this means the, from the heathen nations, and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. In other words, what you do, you work within the framework of whatever nation you might be in, whereby they must guarantee or at least uh, allow you to plant those seeds, to be prayerful, to permit, to, to commit supplications and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks. That's and, and so it is. You cannot, you're to get along with everyone if it be possible. It is not possible to get along with everyone. That's a bypass. But the discernment of spirit, which God's elect are gifted with, can determine that. You know in five minutes. Verse 3. For this is good, and it acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. He sees, he observes, he knows what happens. He sees your good works, and your good works cover a multitude of sins. And, um, and that's as it is, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, I believe it is, 7 or 8. And so therefore you want those good deeds. Why? He's observing it. It's in the book of life. You have a record in heaven, whether you like it or not. It may be bad. If you're bad, it's bad. If you're good, it's good. But on repentance, 
by Christ being so good that he paid that price on the cross, the bad can be erased and God doesn't want to hear about it again. So he does see and he knows how you interact with people. He expects you to stand your ground, yet at the same time being fair and disciplined in serving the living God. That is very important. Verse 4, who will have, or I'd rather translate it, whose will it is to have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of truth. Um, our Heavenly Father, there, there is a better example of this in 2 Peter chapter 3, and um, I, I'm going to read it for you. You're not going to have it. It is God's will, as it is stipulated there, that um, all come into uh, repentance, that um, they, they love the Lord, and that's what He wants. Anytime you have someone teaching a message where God is getting up in the morning and saying, wonder who I can zap today. That's not your father. But whose will it is that all men be saved that come. I, I want to read to you from chapter 3 of, the great, of 2 Peter, the greatest chapter in the world for teaching three earth ages, because all three earth ages and all three heaven ages are brought forth in this third chapter of Peter. But God says in, he, in His teaching through Peter, chapter 3, verse 8, And beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. That means that's the Lord's day, that's the millennium that is coming. It's called the Lord's day. But here's why I brought you here, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. He always keeps it as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. That means he's got all kinds of patience to usward, to everybody. Not willing, this is his wish, not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. But that all should come to repentance. What is repentance? It's to have a change of heart, a change of mind, and and uh, ask God's forgiveness and then be thankful to Him that He has forgiven you, as verse 1 so stipulated. So God, again, I want to say, He's long-suffering. He's got lots of patience. He'll deal with you. He observes you. He watches. He doesn't mind waiting. But it is His will or wish that all come to repentance. They won't. You know that, I mean, uh, in this world, unfortunately, uh, th that there are some that will be so stubborn even after the Lord's Day, that thousand-year period, when they've seen Him in person, they will still go with the deceiver when He's released a short season. That shows you the mindset of some people. They're just not with it. They're bad. But the main thing I wanted you to see is the love of our Father that he, he doesn't wake up and do bad things to people. He simply gives the law which lets you know what happens when you, to you when you do bad things. And it is His will that you'll repent and come out of such foolery and be useful in the kingdom of God. That is ever, ever so very important. That is the mindset of the living God, your Father. And it's important that you know that. He has emotions. He has feelings. And in that first chapter when he said, above all charity, that's love, he loves his children. That's why he destroyed the first earth age and brought in this earth age so he did not have to destroy a third of his children, but to give them the opportunity born innocent of woman to make his or her mind up are you going to serve God or are you going to serve Satan? Your choice. That simple. So let's go with the next verse back in chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Let's interpret that as it's written. Why, why doesn't it say Jesus Christ? Well, Christos is the anointed one. Jesus is Yahweh's Savior. 
So let's read what is that, that the man, the anointed one, Yahweh's Savior, the very purpose of Christ is bringing salvation into the world, opening it, having paid the price on the cross, that if you will believe, if you will repent, long suffering, I would suppose, Emmanuel, God with us, paid the price himself that you could have that redemption simply for the believing and asking and living. Verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. In its own season and everyone in his season, it's, um, this ransom is for real. It's a substance to release you from sin. Okay. When, when you fall short, it's a ransom pain that frees you and releases you from sin. It is, you, you've got to really know how important that is. Your record, it doesn't matter what your little church letter says here on earth. I could care less about what it says. It's what is written by your name in the book of life in heaven, kept there by Almighty God who even knows what you're thinking. And when, when you repent, it's erased from that book. It's not there. It vanishes. It's blotted out. And God doesn't even want to hear about it again. That's the price he paid. And it's a real ransom. And, um, and, and testified, it is testified in due time, made clear to everyone. Do you know when it's going to be made clearer to everyone than most any other time is when God's elect are delivered up and the Holy Spirit speaks through them as it is written in Mark chapter 13, 13 and Matthew 24. What a time that's going to be in its season. And that season is coming. Verse 7. We're in two. I am ordained a preacher, Paul is, and an apostle, that's a sent one. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles, that's to say of the nations, in faith and verity. That means in truth. In truth do I teach it. He, you couldn't have him teach any other way. It doesn't matter how it went down with coming from Paul. It's going to be truth. And so it was that he would do this ordained as God would write in the great book of Acts chapter 9 verse 15 concerning this Paul, he is a chosen vessel unto me. And God chose him to take the message to both the kings and queens of the ethnos, that's to say the nations, to, to, um, to, to, to the Gentile and to Israel. And so it is that uh, Paul teaches on those three levels. Again, how precious it is. Verse 8 to continue. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Doubting means disputing. Don't, don't be arguing about every little detail. Well, Oh, this good brother says it this way and that brother says it that way. How about what God says? Yea, nay, no in between, no, no word by precedent. That is to say what man might say. If what's important is what does God say? You stick with that chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and you'll be a lot better off than listening to jangling um, speech. No disputing. If God says it, you know, sometimes God leaves certain things open to interpretation. But when God himself interprets something, don't you dare try to interpret it. I mean, when he says it with, and answers with an interpretation, that's it. You would be in dire danger if you were to mess with that. So the thing is, you have to listen to the word of God. And that that must be, will be. Verse 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. This means for in public worship or public, you see, 
harlotry, harlots would paint their eyes with a certain shade of purple and so forth that advertised their wear, okay? But what, what he's saying is, uh, there's nothing wrong with using makeup, and there's nothing wrong with jewelry, there's nothing wrong with, with your hair being attended to. It's just that don't overdo it. Be modest in it. Just look nice. Look godly. And, um, and so, so it is. So many people, it does not say, don't you dare braid your hair. Don't you dare. It means don't braid it and put signs in it that advertises uh, something lustful, something of that nature. You don't go there. A child of God wouldn't. And, and so it is. Modest apparel, it, it means dress moderately as, as a Christian woman should and, and look nice. Nothing wrong with looking nice. That's, it's admirable. So don't, don't ever let anyone take that away from you that you can't, you, you just have to maybe wear a, a toe sack. Okay. That, that's not what it says, but that's what some preachers would have you believe Verse 10, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. In other words, the good works are more important than what you wear. But you, you dress modestly and your good deeds speak louder than makeup, hair, or, or, or how you dress. Your good deeds do that. Why? That's, that is your spirit. That is your heart. That is your soul in serving the living God. And how, how precious a good Christian woman is that serves the living God. And, um, and so it is. Um, verse 11, Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. Now here we, we have to think just a little bit. If two wed... Do they not become one flesh? How, how in the world are we going to have this that half of this flesh is going to be quiet and the other half is not when, when they're one? I mean, oneness is where they totally and completely are one in God. That was God's promise when he took from Adam, created Eve, the mother of all living, in that from her would come Christ, umbilical cord to umbilical cord, and you're either in him or you're not living. So, uh, and so there it is. One more verse, verse 12. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, we're going to do a little word research in the next book, 2 Timothy, on this uh, silence. I'm going to give you a little Greek lesson. But at the same time, I want to say, um, at the time of this writing, what did Paul have in his pocket when he was on his road to Damascus? To destroy the church, to drag men and women. It didn't make any difference. Drag them out in the street and even kill some of them as they did Stephen. But it wasn't all that safe and it was kind of in protecting in that sense. But what, what about the end times? What, what, about, what about 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5? You're not going to have it, but make a note of it. I'm going to say it again for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5, and listen very carefully to me. Verse 5 reads, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth, whoa, prophesying is teaching, with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. In other words, what, what are we talking about here? It's not talking about hair. It's talking about you better have the covering of Christ over your head, male or female. Okay. Verse 6, But if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn 
But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Verse 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. In other words, there's a reason he's saying women in the final generation need to be very careful. You need to have Christ over your head. You need to be under the wing of Christ. It's extremely important. He's going to tell you why. And again, I want to say, this is a woman that is preaching, that's prophesying. You know, Philip had four virgin daughters. And do you know what all four of them were? They were prophetess. Now, they, had, they, they were virgins, so they had never known a man. They didn't have a husband. But yet they taught, they were prophetess. And they taught the word of God, and God saw no shame in it. So... Here, here we're coming along here. This leaves kind of a little bit of befuddlement if you're not careful. Well, what is he talking about? Shorn, unshorn? Verse 8. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Verse 9. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Uh, let me ask you something. Who, who brought you into this world? Well, my mama, you bet, women give birth and they bring men into the world. That's the way God arranged it. But God is warning something here that is very important, especially in this generation. Verse 10, For this cause art the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Well, pray tell me, what angels is that talking about? The fallen angels. They're going to return to this earth. And as it is written, as it is written in Matthew chapter 24, it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. The fallen angels are going to be giving and taking in marriage again to women and a woman that has Christ over her head. If she's covered by the wing of Christ, uh, if she's covered by the wing of Almighty God, they will run from her. The point is, they, they rather than being born to woman, they want to seduce woman. And that's what it's about. And in this generation, it would continue on and it would be saying, say it would be a shame for a man to be covered in, the, in that uh, light. Why? Because it would be a perversion. They're not after men, they're after women. And so it is. So, uh, we must be very careful when you realize in the doctrine that assists in the church, in discipline, and in helping people, and encouraging people, that we do not change the Word of God simply to fit a few unlearned so-called teachers of God's Word. We will find that this word silence in a further place, and I'll bring it out to you at a later time, I'm going to teach you something in the Greek language. I'm going to show you the original manuscript, and rather than a woman being silent, it's going to be a woman should not chatter in church. I will not allow anyone to chatter when God's Word is being taught, male, female or child, we have, we have in reverence to Almighty God and God only do we submit and we do not chatter. It, it, I, I am sorry, this will be one time that even the Strong's Concordance cannot help you. I have to take you even a little deeper than that. To, but I will teach you whereby you will be well grounded and know that the Word is not silence, but chatter. Chatter is something that interrupts. That's, what a, that's why the, it's called a bird sometimes, chattering, jangling. It's disrupting. Satan likes nothing better than to have chatter going on when God's sincere word of supplication, of prayer, of intercession is taking place. 
And man should never allow that. You should never allow the flesh body come into <clears throat> any type of celebration that takes away from the simplicity that is in the Word of God and teaching, the being modest, straightforward, honest in bringing forth the Word of God. I, I know and I understand it upsets some people when I say that the Word should be chattered. That's all right. It, let, I, I guarantee you when we come to it, I will educate you on that point. It's very simple. It's simply that you have to go to the manuscripts and we will take it from there. Uh, you know, it is written in Mark 13 when we are delivered up as it is written then in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost Day. What, what was the example going on there? both men and women, which this has to do with the end generation. That's why I'm nailing this right now. That both men and women shall teach and prophesy by the Holy Spirit speaking through them when the Antichrist, when they're delivered up before the false Messiah. Women shall teach. It will be the Holy Spirit teaching through them. There have been many times in the Bible that God has used women. And I know I'm taking a little bit of time on this, but it's necessary. Um, that uh, they, there have been great women students in God's Word. Did you ever hear Deborah? Back when there were judges, um, Israel was being attacked. There was, there was no man judge. Deborah was a woman. And the men said, well, hey, we're done. You may have heard from God that we can defeat them, but we're not going out there. Well, she was the judge. She jumped in a chariot. Off she goes. They had the victory. And even down to the fact of Sisera, the enemy, kind of limped away and crawled into a tent invited in by J.L., a Gentile woman, and she offered him some sweet buttermilk. Lay down and rest yourself. He laid down and get some sweet buttermilk, and that woman drove a tent peg right through his head. Okay. She killed him. So man didn't get to destroy the enemy. Woman did. So God has a way. And then one time in another place, have you ever heard of Huldah? Men at one time in the Scripture, they're confused, and they want to know what God has to say. So they went down to the university, the head of it, and asked Huldah, who was the head uh, of, of the university, of God's house. And they asked that woman the meaning of it, and Hulda gave it to them. So, you see, to say that women should not teach, you've missed a spoke somewhere, or have misspoken. So, you again, I, I take the a little more time maybe than necessary, but I'm going to, I'm going to document before we finish First and Second Timothy, what I'm talking about. Be patient. God's patient, and He's long-suffering, or you. Let's go with the next verse in chapter 2, verse 13. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And we, we know that um, God created uh, Adam and the others, the other races on the sixth day, but on the eighth day, he created eth ha adam that's the Hebrew language of another person. And he created Adam, and from Adam he took the curve, is what it says. You know, a lot of people get upset about this too. It says right there in the King James, rib. Well, you can translate it rib if you want to. The word is curve. Every man still has a full count of ribs, so did Adam. It's the curve, the helix curve in the DNA. Man didn't know about DNA back then, but God did. And he took the feminine part and created that woman that would be the mother of all living, that is to say Eve. And Eve partook, if you would, of, and they both became one, one body. And, and so it was that God created this. Now, 
It is true that um, in this next verse, we have a little explaining to do. Let's go with it. Verse 14, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. I'm going to read that again. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, I, I, want, you, I want to test your memory. What is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? This is... It, it's, it, the, this is the trunk of the body, and these are the limbs. And what is, we have the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ. We have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Who is that? Well, who's evil? Who has that trunk and the limbs that is just absolutely evil? It's Satan, of course. They were not to partake of that tree, which is to say the, the atosh. That's what the Hebrew word is. It's not the Hebrew word for an orange tree or an apple tree is etz, E-T-S. That's not the word used here, taken from atosh, which is the backbone through which the central nervous system runs that will open your eyes to knowledge that will, as it is written in that fourth chapter of Genesis, third chapter of Genesis. And but here they let an Adam off the hook, kind of. Well, I, I want to, what I'm doing, I'm testing your memory. What did Eve encourage Adam to partake of? And he did. Was the same fruit that she did. Well, what fruit was that? The fruit of the knowledge of good and evil off of that tree. So you want to be real careful. How, when you start judging for yourself rather than listening to God's word, verse 15 to complete the chapter, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity, that's faith and love and holiness with sobriety, sobriety. And so it is that woman today, again, I'll ask it, who brought you into the world? It sure wasn't some man, but it was a woman, blessed of God, that gave birth and brought forth uh, God's election as well as all souls in the world. How precious it is. It's the plan of God. When he would say, let us create man in our image, there you are. You look in the flesh just like you did in your spiritual body. You don't want to miss the, any of the lectures in these pastoral lectures. They are very educational, and I think you're going to enjoy them. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The book of Ezekiel. What a fantastic study, this book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel that covers, if you would, those vehicles, those circular disc. In the Hebrew, it states very clearly that that whirlwind with the color amber traced back to the Hebrew, highly polished bronze. What an exciting thing that God's Word informs us on all things. Ezekiel, one of my favorite prophets of the Bible, probably more written, not probably, but absolutely more written on what will happen in the millennium age than even the book of Revelation. Ezekiel guiding you through it, what God will expect at the final battle, Armageddon and Haman Gog, recorded in this great prophecy. I know you're going to enjoy it, the book of Ezekiel. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a, some reverend, some denomination, some church or organization. We're not going to judge people. It's not our right to. God is the judge, and when you start judging, he gets upset with you. If you, you, you just go around and start judging uh, this group, that group, and whatever. You are to use spiritual discernment to cut yourself away from bad groups. That is also very, very scriptural. So, but but let, let your spiritual discernment guide you in what you should listen to and what you should not listen to. It's a God-given gift. 
It's a precious gift. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour. We'll give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. Got a prayer request? You do not need that number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. He created you. We mentioned DNA earlier. Your DNA is different than any person in the world, unless you're a natural twin, identical twin. And, and you know something? Why? Because you're unique. God created you that way because he wanted someone just like you. But he wants you to love him and be a servant of his, a child, a child of God. That's what you are. That's what he wants. He wants your love. Let him know you love him. Won't you, Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Karen from Texas. Um, does this financial situation that only seems to be affecting Europe and the U.S. have any connection to the swarmers? Um, it's odd that the Middle East, China and East, South America and so forth doesn't seem to be having uh, such money problems. Well, how could they have... How could Brazil have money problems when we sent all of our deep shore drilling rigs down to drill offshore? And then we're going to buy the oil and your money is going to go to Central America. Or how about all the oil we're paying from swarmers, that's to say countries that are actually our enemy. We're, we're paying them big time. And why wouldn't China smile? 40 cents of every dollar we spend, they're loaning it and then having we're having to buy back. We can't complain too much, you know. There's only one way if you're broke. There's a little more to this also. You need jobs and here Canada has this beautiful sand oil. It's a high grade oil. And they wanted to sell it to America. They're a friend, an ally. They wanted to sell that oil to us, but oh no, 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 we can't approve that. Let them sell it to China, and they will. If something isn't done, they will sell it to China, and again, China will get real well, and we'll be buying oil from our enemies until, if we're not careful, we could even be defeated. So yeah, the swarmers have quite a bit to do with it. Bob from Indiana, why did Satan tempt Job if he knew that his fate was not going to give in. Well, Satan, you know, you misunderstand, you misunderstand Satan. Satan tempts a lot of people, and boy, they're just mush in his hand. And what he said to God in chapter 1 and 2 in the great book of Job, he said, hey, you've got him all protected, and God does, as long as you ask for it, there's a protecting ring around God's elect. And Satan said, if you just remove that ring of protection, your wing, I can have him eaten out of my hand in just a short time. He really believed he could do it. He thinks he's that good. Okay. And do you know something? With most people, he is that good. He can swarm them. He can con them. He can buy them, they're for sale, you know, if he wants to buy them, and sure enough, a lot of them sell out pretty cheap. He thought he could convince Job, well, he got fooled. Job is just like one of God's elect, they will stand against Satan to the very last end. Deborah from Kentucky, Pastor Murray, do all the elect get delivered up? Most likely in locals, all the way locals, and some even on up, um, into Jerusalem where he is, uh, they will be tried. But as you know in Hebrews, I'm sorry, in Revelations chapter 2 verse 10, no one individual, this gets personal, will have over 10 days trial before the Antichrist. That's a guarantee. After that, you, you can sit back and, and enjoy the show because we're going to win. What happens to the first ones that deliver up after they finish their testimony? Well, I just said that, didn't I? They, they, Satan, you might, many are going to say, well, Satan would kill him, surely. No, he won't. How can he be playing the role of Christ and he's murdering people? 
Have you ever read where Christ murdered somebody? No, of course not. So he can't not be an imposter of Christ if he goes around killing people. He'll try to butter them up. They won't any of them buy it. They're going to be like Job. What will happen to our pets if we are called to, well, God always takes care of things. Don't you worry about it. Okay, question Susie from Indiana. Are there many places in the Bible where God lets us know we will be with our beloved pets again? Somebody must be really, uh, all we can say is read Isaiah chapter 11. God loves his animals. And it is in our nature that we love God's animals. You know, They, they are such good pets and, and, and are so excellent in working. You know, and, um, um, my granddad was the horse and mule buyer for the Ross Horse and Mule Company out of Fort Worth up in Oklahoma when I was in high school and, uh, and uh, younger. And hey, we, we broke a lot of horses right through there back in those days. They, they built America. Okay. We, we've got right here at Gravit, Arkansas, the, the uh, railroad runs right through here. And I know people that were aware and, and sold part of the mules that uh, the uh, railroad company rented to cut some of these right-of-ways. It wasn't done with bulldozers. It was done with horsepower. So God loves his animals. He did in the first earth age. He does in this one. And you can read in Isaiah chapter 11, when we're in millennium and heaven, they're there with us. And there's just one problem, uh, one difference rather. There are no carnivores. Why? Because they also are in spiritual bodies. Gene from Iowa. I love listening and learning God's Word on your program. Well, thank you. I'm a little mixed up about the ten virgins. The first ones were taken by Christ, and the last five didn't have enough oil. Are Christians the first taken or are the last taken? Well, the last weren't taken. They were told, depart from me. I never knew you. The first five are Christians, and believe it or not, the last five are Christians. They make it Christians all the way to the 11th hour, because that's when it was. In the 11th hour, they all made it. But then some of them didn't realize the false Christ was coming first. They didn't have enough oil, which is truth, in their lamp. You see, oil from the olive tree, there's a great deal in this in the languages. Olive in the Hebrew tongue is El Yah. Do you understand those are two names of God, one the title and the other the sacred name in the oil of our people? <clears throat> Have you ever wondered why we use it to anoint? Have you ever wondered why Christos, Christ, means the anointed one with that oil of our people? And Christians are supposed to use it, of course, and so it is. But the second five, everybody that claims to be a Christian, they're just really not. Because they're wrapped up and deceived by the traditions of men that make void the Word of God. It's quite simple. They're taught, many of them, they're not going to be here when that wedding takes place. They're going to fly away. Well, that's not biblical. It is not written, and so it is that they will be deceived. When the false Christ comes, they're going to think it is their flying away. And so a lot of them won't make it. But then, hey, we'll have them to work on in the millennium, taking names, kicking dragon. Okay, Marlon from, um, from Minnesota. Did the destruction of the first earth age when the firmament was it when the firmament fell, and did this make the Grand Canyon and the rock formations in southwest the USA? It, it, it was part of it, yes. It's also the reason the plates shifted. Do you want to see actual proof of it in this generation? All you have to do is make a trip to Ash Falls, Nebraska State Park. I'll say that again. Ash Falls, Nebraska State Park. Do you know what you'll find there? You'll find a, a, um, in that state park, they are digging on a great dig. And do you know what they're finding? 
And we've been there. We have a documentary on it. Rhinoceroses, five types of camel. Every African animal, basically, there is. N none we have in this country. It's a piece of Africa right in the middle of America. How did it get there? Well, it's because the plate shifted. And that's why, I mean, hey, the reason this ash fall is there was a, a, an eruption of a volcano in Idaho, if I remember correctly. I think it was Idaho. It, was Idaho. it came over and covered all of Nebraska with ash, where these animals would go to the water holes and it would it killed them because the ash just covered everything. As a matter of fact, you can still see the ash there. It's kind of crystal looking stuff. But there you will find the, the animals were not torn up by carnivores and scattered. They're in perfect order. Even the camel's tail, every joint, right in place. Documenting that there was an earth age before this one. The catabo brought down that firmament spill. The plates erupted, one slipped over, they divided and we have the nations as they are today. It's all going to go back in place. Revelation chapter 21 demands that the firmament goes back where it was. There will be no oceans, no lakes. It'll be perfect. It will be watered from the dew every night. No storms, and so it is. Francis and Don from Oklahoma. My husband and I watch you every... Thank you. And my question is, in Mark 11, 15, 16, and 17, about the sales in the temple, it's my understanding it is the house of our Father and the house of prayer. Is it okay for churches to have sales to... You know, I don't want... We don't, okay. I, I, we, we have no sales to raise money. We never beg for money. God does not send out beggars. But I do not want to judge another church we never pass a plate in our church. There's never an offering taken up. There is a box, an offering box at the back that's your own personal business. I could care less because I know God sent us and I know that we don't have to beg because um, uh, God doesn't send out beggars. So I, I don't want to talk about raising money. And if somebody else wants to do that, we just do not judge other churches. So. Uh, but we don't, and thank you for the question. Uh, Ronaldo from New York. I want to know why there were animals in the first earth age because they were flesh, and God said flesh and blood cannot be in heaven. Dinosaurs were blood and flesh. This is something I would like to know. Well, haven't you read uh, the chapter in... Second Peter, we were reading in earlier, uh, the third chapter of Second Peter. There's a heaven age and there's an earth age. The dinosaurs were not in heaven. The dinosaurs were on this earth. That's why we can find them here, the remains. So it is true. Dinosaurs could not have been in heaven in flesh because flesh and blood cannot enter the heaven for one simple reason. It's a different dimension. It's spiritual, and flesh is flesh, and earth is earth. Heaven is heaven. Heaven is wherever God is. So uh, probably what you're thinking of, the first earth age still had an earth. It still had a heaven. And that's why Peter teaches it as such, okay? Uh, Phil from Georgia, when Jesus preached to the captives in prison, it said some were freed. It looks to me like they all would be fighting to be free. I just wondered why some were um, were fearful. I think that's what that word is. Uh, you know, we can't. We know that in the uh, First Peter chapter three, verse First Peter chapter three, verse eighteen. He preached to the prisoners. In chapter 4, in the verses, we've, we know a lot of them were freed. We're not to judge people, so we don't know how many were and how many weren't. But that was kind of their millennium, so to speak. But the millennium, those that didn't will still have the millennium. And um, maybe we can kick 
dragon and take some names there. It'll all work out. Not all, I, it's difficult for me as well as I can see that it is for you to understand after someone visually sees Christ, his power and his authority, how they could possibly love Satan. But we know from God's word, the 20th chapter of Revelation, that certainly some of them still will. Judy from Missouri, uh, let me add too, we don't want them with us any longer. Rid of them. The second death, which ends the 20th chapter of Revelation. Judy from Missouri, how do you go about telling someone that the rapture is untrue? Well, you could first say, where is that word in the Bible? And that's not really a fair, but it's, it's not. The word rapture is not in the manuscripts. It's not in any translation. Um, and so it is. We do not. As a matter of fact, Paul in 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he, he makes it very clear. He said, I want to talk to you about our gathering back to Christ. This is one of the simplest places if you can get someone to listen. It's not going to happen until after the son of perdition is revealed in the holy place claiming to be God. We're just not, it's just not going to be. He said, don't let our first letter where most people get the rapture doctrine deceive you. It's not going to happen. You're not going to go back to Christ and or gather back to him until after the Antichrist appears. But you know, if you need more help with it, I have a tape titled Rapture Doctrine. Order it and you'll be well equipped. Brenda from Florida. You see, I could say real easy, if you've got a standard King James in Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 20 through 25, God says, don't you dare cover my outreach saving arms with your kerchiefs that you sow and teach my children to fly to save their souls. I'm against it. In other words, God wants to do the saving. Uh, Brenda from Florida, I enjoy, thank you. My husband will not let me watch your program on TV, but thanks uh, to God, I found the, the daily show on the computer. I'm so blessed to be able to watch it. Thank you very much for being in the internet. Well, you are so welcome and we're, we're happy to be on the internet. I hope now you're, <laughs> I hope we haven't spilled the beans. If your husband doesn't watch television, well then I guess he won't know anyway, will he? Well, welcome aboard. Good to have you. I, I'm not going to say it. You need to cook. Um, thank goodness you found it. Okay. Uh, Don from, Don, I don't know where Don is from. Let's see. I, I'm, oh, from Maryland. Don from Maryland. I want to know if I confess with my mouth and believe in all my heart that Jesus died for my sins and repent for my sins and live my life studying, staying in the Word, learning the Word and being good to the door, to the poor, homeless, and the sick, I'll go to heaven. Well, you, you should be good to everybody, but you don't need to knock yourself out and just do what you can. can. Um, my daughter wants to know, were there angels around God before he created the world? Yeah, they were, because he said to, to, you were there. And he said, let us create man in our image. You were there and you looked just like you did then. That throws some people, but we're, you didn't come out from under a rock out here in the woods. You came from God. You were with Him. If you live a Christian life, then naturally, it's not complicated. John 3.16 says, If God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes upon Him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Okay. Linda from Ohio, did I understand you to say that in the last days there will be no more babies born? that all the spirits will have come down to earth and have to be born of woman? If I understand correctly, please tell me where to find it in the Bible. You, you misunderstood what I said. There will be no babies born in the millennium because we'll all be in spiritual bodies. It is written in the Apocrypha that 
um, that the time will change when all souls have been born of woman and those in the end are weaker. Uh, and it, it does not, it escapes my mind where that is right now because it's in, I believe in Esdras, which is the, he, the Greek word for Ezra. And I, can't, I cannot pull it up in my little computer mind here exactly where that is, but it is written. But what I was talking about was the millennium and spiritual bodies, there will be nobody born. Why? Because spiritual bodies do not have a womb. Tom from South Carolina, I have to work seven days a week to make ends meet. Is this wrong according to the Bible? What does the Bible say about this? Don't be in bondage to man's rules or, or God doesn't make rules that are, will put you in bondage either. Uh, Christ answered this in the 13th chapter of Great Luke, of St. Luke, where he would talk about the 18 that the Tower of Siloam fell on. They weren't bigger sinners than anybody. They were just under the tower. It fell and they got mashed, okay? And then he goes on and he answers about working on the Sabbath that, you know, if you have an ox in a ditch, you're going to pull him out. Well, naturally, if you have to support your family, they're more precious than an ox. Don't, 18, don't put yourself in bondage. That's what thir Luke 13 means. I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, but most of all, God loves you for it. You know what makes His day? When you take the letter he's written you and read it, absorb it, pray over it, makes his day. When you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Now listen to me and you listen real good. Most important, you stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.